Hello. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I like that we have a raucous wow. and engaged audience. Uh, welcome to ICALA, and it's so great to see all these amazing, beautiful faces. Thanks for being here. My name is Ann Elgood. I'm the Good Works Executive Director of the museum, and we are so thrilled to celebrate with you today the opening of our two fall exhibitions, Rebecca Morris, 2001 to 2022, and My Barbarian in our Elsa Longhauser project room. Both of these exhibitions are presentations of 20 years plus of practice by these treasured Los Angeles artists. My Barbarian travels to ICLA from the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York and is curated by Adrian Edwards, who should be here somewhere, but may be hiding from us. Um, the Morris Survey is curated by ICLA former senior curator, Jamila James, to my left, who is now the Manilow Senior Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. I want to give a huge congratulations to all the artists, Rebecca, Malik, Zandro, Jade, all of whom are here. Zandro and Malik are over there. And of course, also to the curators, Jamila and um, Adrian, who I still haven't seen. Congrats to all of them. Let's give them a quick round of applause. I'm really pleased to announce that Rebecca's show will travel to the MCA in Chicago next year, which is fantastic. And there is a forthcoming catalog um, of the show that will come out hopefully in the spring of next year. The Whitney produced an incredible catalog for My Barbarian, which you can see on the bookshelf there and is available for purchase. I want to thank everyone who has made these exhibitions possible, including the funders, the lenders who have so graciously parted with their beautiful works the artist galleries, um, our board of directors, our wonderful board of directors, and our supremely talented staff. And importantly, I really want to thank all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us through your presence and for participating in our exhibition program and our learning and engagement program. We do this for all of you, and it's so great to see you all here. We are proud that this museum does not charge admission. It is always free. Everything we do is free. So please come back, bring your friends, bring your family, and visit us uh, many times for these fabulous shows if you can. Um, we have a lot of upcoming learning and engagement programs, so I'm just going to mention a few. But please, if you're not already signed up for our newsletter, please do so. It's going to start coming out weekly. There's a lot of information there and on our website. So keep track of what's happening, social media, and please come and participate. So without further ado, I'm going to just quickly introduce our two speakers today. Rebecca Morris has had solo exhibitions at the Blaffer Museum in Houston, the Renaissance Society, 356 Mission, and LAX Art, among others. Her first solo mu museum show was, in fact, at the Santa Monica Museum of Art, which is us, now moved and our name changed, which was in 2003. Her work has been included in numerous group exhibitions, including Inherent Structure at the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Made in LA at the Hammer Museum 2016, and the Whitney Biennial in 2014. Rebecca is represented by Corbett versus Dempsey, Bordolami Gallery, and Gallery Barbara Weiss. She is the recipient of awards and fellowships from the California Community Foundation Fellowship for Visual Art, John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award, and Art Matters, among others. Jamila James is the Manilow Senior Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. She was co-curator with Margot Norton of Soft Water, Hard Stone, the 2021 uh, New Museum Triennial Exhibition in New York. Previously, she was here as the Senior Curator and previously to that curator um, for five years, and she was also Assistant Curator at the Hammer Museum, where she did the program at Art and Practice in Limerick Park with me sometimes. That was fun. Um, and she's also held curatorial positions at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Queens Museum in Queens, New York. In addition to producing exhibitions and programs at various alternative and artist-run spaces throughout the US and Canada. During her tenure at ICLA, Jamila curated exhibitions and projects with Sarah Swinner, Harold Mendez, Stanya Khan, Nayland Blake, 
B. Wirtz, Lucas Blaylock, Sarah Kane, Abigail DeVille, Rafa Esparza, Miriam Joffrey, and Anne Green Kelly. So she has a prolific and amazing career. She's also curated several group exhibitions, including The Inconstant World, A Shape That Stands Up, and Sisters and Brothers. Her upcoming projects, which we should all make an effort to get to Chicago to see, includes Enter the Mirror and Living End, Painting and Other Technologies, 1970 to the Present. So, welcome to you both. We're very much looking forward to this conversation, and take it away. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> okay. Uh, after that lengthy introduction, I think we can wrap up. Just kidding. <laughs> we're time. Yes, we're out of time. So it's really great to be back here at ICLA uh, on the occasion of this fantastic survey of Rebecca Morris, a real titan in the field of painting and who has become a friend through the process of realizing this survey. So I am excited to be in conversation with her in front of all of you. Thank you so much for coming here today to support the ICLA and Rebecca and my barbarian who are incredible, incredible artists. So cheers to all of you. So let's get started and talk about, now that we're on the other side of organizing the show, what were some of your objectives with thinking of a survey and thinking about your work across 20 years? I wanted to, to make a survey show that could ex you know, tell the quote story of my work in a way that it didn't feel like there was one story to tell um, and that it could show the complexity and the variety of what I make but in a way that didn't feel chronological. I mean, I've given a lot of talks on my work as a professor and as an artist at various schools, and it's really hard to do these talks on your work, and I think like making a survey show is sort of like making the show about your, t you know, like the talk is the visual record of slides or images, and the, this is the real thing. So, you know, I've thought a lot about like, how do I tell the story? How do I create a, lar a narrative that isn't based just on chronology, like this to this to this, and how to get at something that's a little more interesting or a little less linear. Um, I don't make the work in a super linear way, and so I wanted a show that didn't feel that way. I mean, one thing that's come out from making this show is um, I could easily, we could easily like take this down and do 27 other paintings that would look completely different and tell a really different version. And that's something I'm, I'm interested in. I have such plans for Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be in your inbox next week <laughs> about these things. But yeah, I think that was one of the constant things with working with you on this exhibition was how to subvert this format of the survey exhibition and not have it be just this straightforward history, just knowing that your process is not straightforward. So instead being true to what your practice is and have it be a bit more discursive. I mean, while the title suggests a chronology, it's from 2001 to 2022, it's not a straightforward narrative of what Rebecca's work is. And it was really important for us to kind of break that model. While it points to you know, the earlier survey at the Renaissance Society in Chicago that was titled 1996 to 2005, this show overlaps a bit with that. And treats it almost as a starting point to see how Rebecca's work has progressed and changed and also you know, come back to certain ideas time and time again. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the floor plan, which is one of those things that when an artist and a curator are working together, it's kind of the insider baseball of organizing a show. And there's certain things that happen in this space that might not readily reveal themselves. So let's talk a little bit about our ideas for the construction and the plan for the show. Um, I wanted something, we both wanted something really open um, where you could have sight lines that gave you cross sections of views so you could see multiple paintings um, in viewpoints together, you know, like maybe at times six, sometimes two, so you could have kind of more targeted and then more expansive and then opportunities since the work is often quite big in scale to back up from it to see it at, at points like the longest distance the museum could 
provide. And, but then also, you know, not having benches and things in the space so that you always felt like you could get very up close to the paintings if you wanted to as well, and that kind of macro and micro experience. And then I think we also talked about, you know, st the two built walls in the space are L-shaped, and so they encourage a kind of walking and following through the space, and it's not symmetrical. It could create um, internal spaces. So there's kind of two galleries, but then it's, it's a little more, uh, it's not as um, concrete as two boxed rooms. Yeah, the gallery really can accommodate all kinds of configurations. And for those of you who come here very frequently, you know that there's been a wall um, segmenting the gallery since 2019. And this has been the first opportunity to really open up the space so that you can see the back wall as it was when the museum opened in 2017. But it's also a callback to the 2005 show where there were two large paintings in the, on the horizon that a viewer would encounter kind of through an aperture through the built construction in this space. So I was really excited to make that kind of conceptual linkage to the show, but also change it and really work with the space as a, a type of material in the show. So in terms of coming to the paintings that are in the exhibition, we did a lot of research. We did yeah. a lot of close looking at your work. You're very prolific, so it was very difficult <laughs> to come to uh, the number of paintings that are in the exhibition, which are 27. So the way that we went about organizing the show was to skew chronologi chronology, but to think about gestures, motifs, um, reoccurring marks that are in Rebecca's work. So one of those is the grid, which has its own history and has its own baggage, but also can be an exciting way to organize space and organize ideas. So for you, Rebecca, when you started painting, when did you start using the grid in your work? And why did you start using the grid? I don't remember either of the answer. I mean, I don't know when I started and I don't even remember why. So, I mean, I, I said this earlier when we were walking through the galleries, like as a kid, I drew cross sections of houses and architectural plans, which are all a kind of grid. Um, I think I've always been interested in the grid in the way that I'm interested in certain kinds of architecture, brickwork, um, the way stones are laid, um, you know, just really basic ways that the grid is in our lives as, in a, as a vernacular thing. Um, I think the grid became more prominent for me as a, a structure when I started working as an abstract painter. I, I was originally in school and when I started graduate school I was making observational realist paintings. And so the grid became a way to organize space and create um, a way to start. Um, and, and I think like even a rect a rectangular canvas or a square, a square canvas is kind of like a metric of a grid. And seeing you know, a painting even like that is, is a way that I think about you know, the entire surface of a painting. Yeah, the grid is a way to fragment um, the space of the canvas, but it's also a containing structure as well. And I'd have to, I'd be remiss to not mention that you started using, I think the grid maybe ap appeared in the earlier show, which was at the Renaissance Society mm -hmm. in Chicago. The city of Chicago is built on a grid. Yes. And it's where you studied, right. you got your post back, you yeah. did your MFA in Chicago. And I think something that is important to understand is, you know, the place of Chicago in your work and how Chicago relates to Los Angeles as well, which is where you moved after um, your time in the Midwest. Yeah, that's super smart. Yeah, you're right. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just winging it. <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, it's true. I mean, I, I grew up in Connecticut and I grew up out in, in New Haven a little bit, but then outside. And so I wasn't living in an urban grid, you know, and went to college and was not also in a big city. So Chicago was the first real kind of urban city that I really lived in and I mean I loved it I love Los Angeles I mean yeah also all the great diagonals in Chicago the kind of quick ways to get someplace but they faster do, they throw a curveball that yeah. just messes up the yeah. <laughs> yeah but I mean speaking of Chicago something that is related and unrelated is um, one of my favorite streets in Chicago is Wacker Drive 
And Wacker Drive is a street in Chicago that has an east, west, north, and a south, as well as an upper and a lower, and maybe even a lower lower. And I was fascinated with this street there, and as soon as I got a car, I was driving all over Lower Wacker Drive and figured out all the fast, super shortcuts to get from one place all the way to the train station, and you'd be, it was amazing. So like, that kind of structures and systems and, um, there was a parking garage in New Haven, Connecticut when I was a kid that was attached to a department store that we went to and it's um, a parking garage where you can drive up all the ramps and get to the roof and when you drive down the ramps you hit the half floors. I don't know how to explain this. Yeah. There's, I think there's one in LA that's like this too so you can go, there's like one, two, three, four, five and then when you go down you hit the, it's amazing. So if you went up and you couldn't find parking, you don't need to worry because you've not hit all the floors because now when you go down, oh, yeah. the other side is all, st so this was like, it's so fascinating, I can't even explain it. So, <laughs> but it's, it's designed by Paul Rudolph and it's in downtown New Haven. It's still there. So, but th again, like, so yeah. just, you're helping me think. Yes, yes. So the show itself, as we've said, doesn't hew to any chronology, but instead to an index of marks, of gestures that appear in the work. And with laying out the show as we have, we're not grouping together these examples of these gestures, but instead allowing different works to be in conversation with each other through proximity. Another major feature in the exhibition is the lobster claw, which is kind of this softer triangular form that kind of looks like it's cutting across the surface of the painting. And it's a relatively new gesture, but it's been present around since 2006. The first one is in the exhibition. It's in the, um, one of the corners of the exhibitions. But I wanted to talk to you about how you go about thinking of these devices and something like the lobster claw in particular, how did that form appear for you and how did it start? The first one came about through drawing and I was drawing um, uh, these circular shapes and thinking about how the circle could break off into space and sort of mirror movement um, and thinking about uh, futurist futurism um, and cubism and the flat kind of way of having three-dimensional space. Um, and I just started doing these drawings um, and I kept doing them and doing them and doing versions of versions and versions. And then I, I was also thinking about how all of these shapes could create energy and movement within the stillness and the um, parameters of the frame of the canvas so that there could be all this movement then it would be like stopped at the edge. Um, and so I think that's how the first lobster call call. And I wanted a really kind of circular dynamic energy. And I think in, in the paintings before that, the, I was doing more field paintings, mm -hmm. paintings with pores or an all over composition. So this became a way to have pictorial devices that contained an internal world into and of, of themselves, of their own symbols and language. So it wasn't sort of a sprinkling across, it didn't connotate the idea that this kept going outside of the picture plane. It was about a way of kind of crystallizing something very specific inside. Um, and they're always vertical because I think that's the kind of energy, um, this sort of upward and sweeping energy. And the hook shape is, you know, just like a, a circle with a, with a grab to it. Yeah. It's one of my favorite moves that you do because it's so unusual, but the way that you approach the layering of information within those, it's another way to frame and contain information. And a, a term that we've used in talking about some of the shapes within the work is compartmentalization. And that happens with another um, type of painting in the exhibition where there is a frame, there's a border, there's a margin that's organizing, you know, various marks and gestures along the perimeter of the painting while there's something completely different happening towards the center. So my question for you is, what is exciting to you about working in that way where there is a margin, but there's also a center that's quite distinct? I like the idea of an area where you're not supposed to make marks in. 
um, an area that feels outside of the picture but is still inside the picture. Um, but just thinking about how to break down the kind of traditional hierarchy of what an image is supposed to be composed of. I like the idea of a margin containing marginalia that could possibly be more important or more interesting than this central image to sort of shift that. Um, I also like, at, I mean, when I think in the first ones that I made, I figured out, oh, I have this whole area I can do in this border that can have a completely different painting in it. And then I can do the central painting in the center. So it was just a way to kind of break my own rules and to do more of what I wanted in the painting. Um, it also plays with proportions. You know, none of the borders are ever the same width every side. There's all kinds of little measurements that aren't quite the same. I mean, they're the same across or at the top, but there's lots of nerdy things like that. And, and, that, and I do that with the size of the paintings too. It's very rare there's a perfect 55 by 55. It's like 56 by 57, you know, 128 by 123. And all of these are about kind of, they, they're about disrupting um, a, a way that you perceive the work. It creates like a little itch to the way that it looks. Um, and I think like with the margins in these borders, I can create another kind of itch inside the shape of the painting where I'm playing with these strange little depths or widths. Um, so it, it's, you know, it, it's that and it's, it's just like other ways to get a painting in a painting. So you have a painting in a painting in a painting in a painting. There's one that's really like that with the scallops. Yes. Yeah. Like a, like a, those dolls. Mm -hmm. Do you think of it as a system? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when looking at your paintings, there are some organizing structures. Like we talked about the grid, we talked about these containing um, margins, but there's also this idea of there being no system. There's a couple of paintings in the exhibition where it looks as if shapes are kind of, shapes and fragments are kind of floating in space and there's nothing that's necessarily tethering them within the picture plane. So I'd be curious to talk a little bit more about how those paintings operate and how you maybe plan for something like that. Like the blue painting? Yeah, the blue painting, also the silver one that's a little bit earlier that has kind of the larger um, circles with patterns inside them. I'm still thinking about the border question and how I didn't answer that well. No, it was, it was great, it was great. Um, well, the, 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 the blue painting, which is like, I think right behind me on the yes. other wall is um, that it again, it's just like this, this thing I set up for myself. So instead of making one painting, I get to make like 45 little paintings in a painting and then it's set in this blue ground. And I, I and then what's, what, how I arrived at that is before I was doing all these mini paintings in a painting and people would kind of refer to them as patchworks or quilts mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to make the shapes more autonomous from each other so that one shape didn't have to be dependent on the perimeter of its adjacent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where some of the really empty paintings started where they could just be autonomous and floating. And then I think I went back to that idea, but instead of the field between the shapes being just gesso and white, it was a color. Um, in the blue painting, I really wanted to make a painting that was primarily blue because I don't work with that color that much. Yeah. And I knew I was avoiding it. So I wanted to figure out how could I make like a, how could I make a blue masterpiece? So um, <laughs> I, I you know, was trying to think of what's the blue that would be the blue of a masterpiece. And it, it, it felt like, you know, oh, this French kind of purpley blue, yeah. um, and I did that first so I couldn't back away from it. And then I, I left, I put the blue on but left all these holes in the painting that I would then fill up with these sort of mini paintings. And so that became like an exciting device to do. And then at the same time, there might be paintings that I'm working on adjacent that are, the little mini paintings are a totally other painting that's oh. nearby. Um, I'm wandering. Yeah, so it gets some of us reproduced across various yeah. surfaces. Yeah, but it's a way to have kind of plenty 
and a lot of things happening, but it is fairly ordered and it, it's very balanced. I mean, for how irregular it is, it's incredibly balanced, I think. And sometimes I worry that maybe I get too balanced or it gets, so there has to be things that rupture the balance, like something that's not beautiful or something that's not painted as well as it could or you know, things that are too quick or too fast or um, accidental things that I decide to leave, all to kind of disrupt a kind of classical sense of beauty or balance, or a color that's kind of awful. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get back to beauty in a second, but you brought up blue as a color that you don't use ordinarily, and there's a couple of paint, there are a couple of colors that appear again and again in the show, pink, brown, silver, red, but are there colors that you avoid generally, and why? Or is it all an even playing field for you? No, it's not even. The blue is, but I've been working really hard on blue. I have a lot of blue paintings in my studio, so it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> um, purple. I don't use, I don't make, I have made a few totally purple paintings, but I don't know, there's, I go through moods like, I. I I want to use yellow more, and I've made a few yellow paintings, and um, there's one yellow painting I made in particular in 2002, and it was four years after I lived in LA, and I remember when I made it, I had, um, it was a cadmium yellow medium paint, and it was not, it was really cadmium yellow medium, it was quite expensive, and I remember I did a pour, it was like an entire tube of paint with, you know, solvent, and I poured it all over like a six or seven foot painting uh, on the floor, and it was wet, and it was just glowing this yellow up, and I thought, I just made the Los Angeles painting. It was like that pure yellow color, and I think of this city, the color yellow, so extricably. And then I remember I made that painting and then I made, I, had another, I made an exact mirror of it knowing that one wouldn't stay yellow and it would go another direction and it did. But I think yellow is a color that I'm not avoiding but I would like to use a lot more because it, to me it is like the color of Los Angeles and there's just something about the sun and the oppressiveness of the heat and that feeling of that color having um, a physical reaction. Yeah, I mean, yellow is one of my absolute favorite colors in Incredible painting, color. but I know it's like a hard one to work with as well, just as red is yeah. also. And we've had conversations about the color red and your relationship yeah. to it. Red as opposed to pink, which is a whole other yeah. conversation. But there's, a couple, there's three examples in the show of red paintings that you've referred to as the ultimate red painting or this quest towards making the perfect red painting. So let's talk a little bit about that um, and what, what that means for you to try to master, or is it an attempt at mastering the yeah. color red? Yeah, I, it's, again, it's this objective idea about making a red painting and that I it was like, well, you know, every amazing artist should be able to make a red painting. Like that should be like what you should be able yeah. to do. <laughs> you know, like if you're really good, you should be able to make a really good red painting. I mean, this is just like what I say when I'm sitting in my chair in my studio. and. Um, I don't think I'd really been, I don't know if I was making them or not, but I just had this idea of a particular kind of red, and so I started trying to get at this color and figure it out, and um, I wasn't getting it right. I wasn't like meeting this internal idea of what it was, but I was getting places that I wanted to get to. So the ultimate red painting is I figured out what it is, and I just keep trying to get it. So like I thought maybe the red painting in, on this side was an ultimate red painting, but it's not quite the right red I have in mind. It's not primordial and earthy enough. That's such a cadmium, medium red light color, and I think it's more of like a red oxide, earthy, Rothko, Senegram painting series kind of red. Um, something that just feels timeless and like clay out of the earth, something like that. Um, so I'm still trying, but the, but the, it's not about whether it works or not, it's really just a goal, and so it leads me through ideas in the work. And um, there are plenty of times where I've abandoned, you know, the ultimate red painting and then just kept going with it being a red painting but not of this particular shade. So it's, it's a helpful way to kind of 
pull myself through the work. And it doesn't matter if I get there or not. I do imagine I have this idea that if I can do it, I probably would stop and that would be enough to just hit the goal. But I'm not sure. We got to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> you just got to keep, keep, yeah. keep going. But I think like that. historically red is such an amazing color. We, a culture, across cultures, it's, um, it's such a, a power color, an emotional color, a bodily color, an earthly color. It's an elemental color. And, and that's what really appeals to me about it. And then there's the related pink, which has its own story, but yeah. it appears multiple times within the work. And we talked a bit about this the other day that the pink has this kind of endless psychological space. Yeah. Um, and you use kind of these pinks that are, I don't want to say impure, but the ballet shoe pink that's like a little bit dusty, a little bit murky, but then there's like these brighter examples of pink and then there's magentas and then there's all these other variations of it. Yeah, pink is the color where I never want, I mean, I've been making pink paintings since I was a kid. Um, I stopped at one point making pink paintings because when I was in graduate school, the only thing that people wanted to talk about was that I was like a woman making pink paintings. And, and I, I, when I look at that work, they're right. They're very kind of hyper feminine and those were, you know, those were remarks that were on point. But, um, and I hadn't figured out how to complicate the use and critique of pink yet. Um, but I also resented that, you know, um, that that I was sort of that the that the discourse of pink would change if it was about my work rather than someone else's. And Howard Dina Pindell talks about this in an interview regarding her experience of Yale, selling, saying that that just made her want to make pink paintings and work with glitter even more. Um, and I totally relate to that. Um, but I think the critique and analysis of the color pink is really. Um, isn't where it should be. I mean, there should be a lot more writing about it. It's much more complicated. I think we're in a more interesting place in our in the world and how we think about gender today. Mm -hmm. That this is um, this could be, you know, this this is just not dealt with in a way like when you think of Chris, um, Philip Guston's work. Like, how often is the color pink taken on? In, in his work. I mean, I, I actually Google it fairly frequently because I'm waiting and Amy Silman talks about it in a recent um, essay and she talks about it. I think she says that it's, um, how does she put it? It's pretty good. It's, it's, it's like the uh, kind of color of being human. Um, and I think a student of Philip Guston's tackles it. But I was even at a talk with Philip Guston's daughter and somebody in the audience asked like, can you talk about your father's use of pink? And she was like, yeah, I just liked it, you know? <laughs> and it would never be that simple yeah, I, I don't, for I any feel like, other you know, <laughs> yeah. I didn't get to say that. Yeah, yeah. So, but, 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 but going back to like, it's not just that, it, it's also that I think it is an extraordinarily beautiful and complicated color. And it, it's almost the color that I feel has the most range psychologically and as a human on the planet. It's the body, it's beautiful, it's ugly, it's the most disgusting thing. I mean, Joan Schneider makes some of the most repellent pink paintings yes. you'll ever see in your life where they look like the paint is an open wound. Um, and I love that. So speaking of histories, there's a number of histories that I think that your work might be in conversation with, but of course, because you're working in the present, they're not you know, directly related to them. Thinking about your time in Chicago, working with you know, people that were affiliated with the Chicago Images. We've talked about Support Surface, the French movement of artists that were really subverting the way that painting is experienced. Pattern and decoration is something that's come up, you know, especially with the recent show at MoCA by Anna Katz, who might be in this room somewhere. Um, when I first encountered your work, it was in 2010 in New York at this time, where there was this new, kind of newish language of abstract painting happening. It was the discussion around casualism slash oh, yeah, yeah. provisionalism, but I've never been comfortable in thinking about your work in relation to that either. So if you were to frame where you see your work <laughs> and what, what, are your, what you're res might be responding to, this is are you responding? I can't answer yeah. this question. It's too hard. It's a, it's a, it's a big one. It's, 
I mean, what do you think about... This is also the question, like, I'm supposed to do at my teaching job, and it's Ah. so embarrassing to be, like, here saying, like, oh, I don't know, but... I don't know, it's hard. I mean, it comes from so many places. I mean, obviously, I'm one of the most, one of the super exciting things about being a painter at this moment is time is how much time is behind us and how much we can look at and draw from. And I feel that this is th- the, the hardest thing and the most exciting thing is to have this history. And it's a, it's a screwed up history. Um, it's getting better in a lot of ways, um, but if that's the thing. That it's kind of everything. I mean, things that I'm, that I, I mean, you've named a lot of things I like. I mean, there's also design movements mm-hmm. that are really interesting to me, like certain, um, like Werner Verkstade, and then, you know, Memphis is something that's come up yeah. with my work before, um, things like this. Um, there's kind of like, you know, shingling on roofs that happens in certain parts of the East Coast uh, mm-hmm. where I grew up that I'm really interested in, in scallops, um, Victorian houses. So all of this is, is kind of in there. But in the history of painting, you know, I do love, um, you know, the mid-century, you know, who we think of as the masters. I mean, it's a complicated moment that has not been historicized accurately. Sure. But there are really incredible artists in that time period. Um, It's hard, you know, it's hard for me to answer this. Yeah, I was looking at the work, you know, during install, and I thought a bit about Clifford Still. Oh, I love Clifford Still. Yeah, who's an artist that was kind of like a gateway drug for me with um, (laughs) abstraction. (laughs) And being at the Art Institute and staring at Clifford Still paintings and trying to make sense of it. But I think one of the things that's really exciting about your painting is that you can stare and stare and stare, and there's always going to be something else that reveals itself while you're looking intently. So before I, we open it up to questions, because it's almost that time, I wanted to talk to you about your manifesto from 2004 and thinking about being past something, something being in the past. The manifesto for abstractionists and friends of the non-objective, how much of it still feels relevant to you? Everything. I mean, I wrote it in a really open way. I, I don't, I think it's, yeah. Sometimes I get asked if I would make another one and I, I don't think I need to. I still can use this one. Um, I mean, it all feels relative. I mean, I'll say there's certain things like, there's one line, wake up early, fear death. Yeah. That's for sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that in a negative yeah. way. I, I mean, I just mean like, you know, I wake up early every day because I have a lot I want to get done, you know, and I, I, I know time is finite and I want to get as much done as I can and I feel guilty sleeping in because I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's like, it's anxiety, of course, but, you know, I, and also at my age now, I'm in 53 and I think like, like at a moment like now where it's, I can look at this moment 21 years this way, and I hope there's 21 years in the future, but you know, what if there isn't, you know? Like, I I mean, we've just lived through a really intense time where we have reckoned with this, and, um, you know, so wake up, feel, you know, wake up early, fear death is like about wanting to use my life in, in the ways that, you know, give me the most meaning and to really always be present with that. and what is it? What? I when in doubt, spray paint it gold. That's yes. <laughs> that's good to keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, Triangles are your friend. Mm-hmm. Um, Always look at super graphics, suprematism, and macrame. That's mm-hmm. super true. Yeah, yeah. Abstraction ever died? Yep, motherfuckers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think. I think that's a good point to open up to questions if someone wants to run a mic. Wow, this is a really, uh, wow, there's a lot of territory to cover here. Um, let's see, raise your hand and yeah, let's go back to, and shout it out. Yeah, you can do that. Come on. Unless up. you're impossible to get to. Hi, uh, I had a question regarding history. 
Yeah. How did it influence your practice to do your MFA in an institution associated with uh, an encyclopedic museum as, as the, uh, art, the Institute of Art of Chicago? I think you mentioned in jail that exploring language and painting without paint and for a, uh, into thinking about placement and formalism was done when you were doing your MFA. And the museum is such a place that, um, you know, it, be, it becomes in its own nature, because of its own nature, a full placement of history, of um, context and formal thinking uh, of art history and art making. So I, I was wondering because the, the school has the painting majors up the sculptural fellows in the basement of the museum, and you guys have to cross the museum to see each other every day. You're thinking specifically about the School of the Art Institute of Chicago? Exactly. Yeah. The sculptures are in the basement. They are. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's heavy? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I, I'm not quite sure where the question is in there. Um, Maybe when maybe when you're when you were a student, like what did you have any interaction with any of the sculptors? No, and did we that did, have any we didn't. I mean it yeah. was very separate, it was very isolated and, and you know, I think this is probably a, an apt criticism of the school and you know, where I teach now at UCLA, one of the most incredible parts about the school is that it's completely interdisciplinary and all the graduate studios uh, all the graduate students from all six disciplines are in one studio building together working with facilities, and I think this is really dynamic. Um, I think the School of the Art Institute is in an urban city, and their program is really big. Um, but it definitely meant that the painting and drawing students were completely in their own universe, and I didn't know a lot of people outside of that, so that was not as dynamic as it could have been. Um, but I, I don't know what else. I mean, is there, can you, did I get that? interaction with the encyclopedic nature of the museum. Ah. Like, oh, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, no, that was incredible. I, I mean, I also worked at the film center when I was a student there, uh, and so I was going to the film center constantly and seeing all the movies for free, and then filing all the reviews and articles about everything that was coming out about the film center. So um, film is something that I'm really uh, passionate about in terms of watching and has a huge influence on my work. Um, um, like Bergman's Cries and Whispers and his use of red in that film is a huge influence to me. Um, but yeah, no, and when I was in school there, um, when you'd walk from the front of the museum to the back, it was this long hallway and it was where they had all the armor. So I was passing all that metallic armor like for three years. And so yes, just got in there, right? It's amazing, I mean, to, to go to an art school that's attached to an encyclopedic museum is huge. And I love, muse I mean, I love going to look at work. Um, yeah. Thank you. Another question. Okay, well, I see a... Oh. Yeah, go to Mary Weatherford, oh, hello. So the show starts. The show, I can't help but notice I believe you moved to Los Angeles in 1999. Eight, yeah. 1998. Why does the show start two years after your move to Los Angeles? <laughs> because when I moved here, somehow I had heard about a woman who was making brown paintings. And when I heard that, I tried to find them. <laughs> and then when I saw them, I tried to find that woman. So. And you found me. I did. Thank God. Why do you put the needle down two years later? I think we did it that way because of the Renaissance Society show that I had 
in 2006, and that show was 1996 to 2005, and that show heavily weighted on a lot of the work from that period. And I think we felt that that was very well represented there. And I mean, there were even some paintings that we had from 2001 that we edited because they were of that other moment. And it was harder to bridge that moment and get everything up until then in this show. I mean, you know, sometimes it's just, again, it's like the story you're telling, but that was sort of this cutoff. I will also say about the year 2001 and living in LA is, you know, when I moved here, the work changed. And I think in 2001, the change that happened is the sort of calibration that everything since then has really been in direct yeah. communication with. So not that that work was transitional, but it was a work that was connected to another location, another time in my life. So 2001 feels like a really good moment where a kernel started to take hold. And there was looking at things from the late 90s. I like to look at everything because I'm a fool, but <laughs> because I want to get the full understanding of like where an artist is coming from and how to make the most ideal exhibition. And it was kind of working that way forward, not wanting to repeat too much of previous exhibitions, but wanting to capture certain marks, like certain firsts that were important to understanding where Rebecca was going, what direction she was going with the work. And we also wanted to, I think one of the things that had to be a guardrail for the show was the inclusion of Frankenstein, which is one of the last titled paintings, was a titular work in Rebecca's show at the Santa Monica Museum in 2003. But 2001 felt like a neat time to start and have some overlap, but not too much, so that we can really emphasize the works that were made later, especially there's a heavy emphasis on paintings in the 2010s in the exhibition. Thanks, Mary. I think we have time for one more question. There's Tyler Blackwell in the corner. Oh, God. I feel like when I know someone and they ask a question, it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Tyler, don't hurt us. Hi, um, you've talked a little bit about this sort of nature and the, some of the questions have been about the Chicago-ness um, of your work. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit, I mean, all of this work, right? Or all, yes, all of this work is from living here, while living yeah. here. So can you talk a little bit about Los Angeles-ness um, and the importance of living here and how that affects the paintings? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the light in this city is really intense. It is all or nothing, pretty much. It's either sunny or it's dark outside. You know, it's day or night. Um, I've always had studios here that are like Western facing or my current studio, which I've been in for about 12 years, is all skylights. So, um, and I don't work with any electric light. I only work in the day and work with daylight. Um, for color and it's just what I like. I mean, the, the light here is so beautiful um, and I feel well in this light. Um, and the surface of the paintings too, I think, has a very dry, almost stucco, concrete, cement, fresco kind of quality, which I think is, you know, about you know, I think that's something that's directly connected to this city in terms of architecture and urban, you know, everything is a, a hard surface, or not everything, obviously, because people in LA and we all love how much green space there is, but in terms of when you're thinking of the built environment, so much of it is like a hard, dry kind of surface. And then I think the, the color in my painting is very inflected by Los Angeles, especially in some of the paintings, like um, some of the pinks, which get very, um, uh, they're saturated, but they also feel very transparent and washy and um, like you're looking through a sort of diffused, um, blinding light where the light is so bright you sort of lose the ability to see color at times. Um, 
you know, certain pastel colors are used here all the time, or the color of the sky, a light quality. Um, it's also even, like the landscape too, yeah. like the striated landscape. You have the hills, you have the flats. There's that layering of information happening in the paintings as well. And also, LA has an undiscernible architectural style. So there's like no clear signature to the architectural yeah. style here. And there's also not a clear signature in your work as well, which I yeah. think makes it really exciting. Yeah. Great. Well, it is the booching hour, four o'clock. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Congratulations. And please get up personal, close and personal with the paintings in the gallery. I also want to thank my friends at ICLA, the lenders, the galleries. Thank you so much. Yes, Have a good thank one. Thank you, Jamila. Yay, we did it. I mean, I don't think they mentioned that she's in it. Chicago's good. They're keeping me busy, I'll tell you that. <laughs>